Many scientists believe that man never saw a dinosaur, that they're separated from man by 100 million years, or at least 65 million years. There are, however, many scientists who disagree with that based on the empirical evidence. And there is a great deal of evidence that man and dinosaur did exist at the same time. We want to look at some of that evidence this morning, especially what we find in Acumbaro, Mexico. This is an area where we find ceramic dinosaurs from over 3,000 years ago that were excavated in the early 1900s. It's very obvious that these ceramic figurines are of dinosaurs. There are a number of different styles and materials that were used in making them. This is down in Mexico in the Central Highlands in the state of Guanajuato in the city of Acumbro. This is a very interesting colonial city with a, a rich history. And in this brochure that advertises the city, we're told that there we find the Chipicoro culture, which was uh, over 3,200 years ago. And it is from that culture that we find these figurines. The culture was actually uh, defined and discovered, or co-discoverer, uh, Waldemar Yulsrud, who immigrated from Germany uh, to Mexico in the uh, early 1900s. He was actually escaping what he saw developing uh, in uh, Germany at that time that he did not appreciate and wanted his boys away from that. And to escape Nazi Germany, came to Mexico. He was a trained archaeologist and uh, became very famous for his work here in Mexico uh, and certainly well known in the city. This is the museum that houses most of the Chipicoro figurines and uh, artifacts and is the museum of the Chipicoro culture in the city. Chipicoro, just about eight uh, kilometers north of Acambaro in the same vicinity. Uh, in the early 1900s, uh, uh, Waldemar Yulsrud was uh, a prominent resident here of the city and was riding horseback one morning out uh, in the outskirts of town near El Toro. This is a mountain uh, there at the, uh, the edge of the city. And at the base, uh, we find a number of uh, archaeological excavations. He was riding along an irrigation ditch and saw some of the figurines sticking out, stopped him. Uh, excavated them and from that found uh, thousands of these and ultimately collected over 30,000 which filled his house. He was uh, consumed with his interest in this culture and especially the dinosaur figurines. This is the house as it appears today. It's been turned into a hardware store but it's a large mansion that takes up most of a city block. Charles Hapgood uh, actually brought my attention to this. Uh, he's professor of history, or was professor of history and anthropology at the University of New Hampshire. He is now deceased. But he had heard about these and came down to Mexico to investigate. And these are photographs that were taken when he was investigating in the early 50s. And from these photographs, you can see that Obviously, they're strange creatures, but uh, especially here in the foreground, you see obviously din dinosauran features. And these were from the uh, collection uh, that had been amassed by Waldemir Yulsrud over a number of years while he was collecting these. Uh, Hapgood enlisted the aid of Earl Stanley Gardner, who was uh, a friend, uh, obviously uh, very good at investigating mysteries. He was a criminologist. He uh, had been uh, district attorney in the uh, county of Ventura in California for over 30 years and, of course, had written uh, the Perry Mason stories. And he's the author of uh, those famous TV movies as well as many, many books. He's referred to on the website that describes him as the world's most famous lawyer. He wrote a book about this mystery called The Host with the Big Hat the same author that wrote Perry Mason, described this mystery and his investigation of it. Uh, obviously, it's controversial uh, because it describes the coexistence of humans and dinosaurs, and some scientists would just dismiss it outright because of the philosophical implications. 
not because of the actual evidence. This would fly in the face of evolutionary theory, and so no matter who it is or how much evidence, they're not going to accept it. Here we see a picture of Professor Hapgood, Earl Stanley Gardner, together with Carlos Yulesrud, who was the son of Waldemir Yulesrud, and they worked together to try to solve this mystery and to prove that uh, the father, Waldemir Yulesrud, was not the one who manufactured these, which is what the critics were saying. 33,000 figurines, <laughs> a variety of styles and materials, uh, just mind-boggling array, uh, all from one individual was the, I think, ridiculous claim. But Earl Stanley Gardner was invest, uh, enlisted to help uh, investigate this and to prove it. And here we see him looking closely at some of these figurines. And he has pictures of them in his book. Here is one of the pictures from his book. And we notice the title, which says that dinosaurs do appear abundantly throughout the collection. He interviewed at length Carlos, the son of Waldemar Yulesrud, who had uh, gone out with his father to excavate on a number of occasions and had found numbers of these things uh, while he was uh, working with his father. He also uh, here is seen interviewing uh, Professor Hapgood, and the two of them worked together. And notice in his book the description of the work that was done to refute the idea that uh, Waldemar Yulesrud was the author, the manufacturer, the source of <coughs> these dinosaur figurines. Uh, here, quoting from Earl Stanley Gardner, Professor Hapgood lay awake at night trying to devise new tests, new places to dig. He even went to a road which had apparently been undisturbed for many years, and by many years he's referring to hundreds of years. He dug under the road with permission from the government and sure enough, found the Yulesrud type figurines under the road. He continues saying, in many places in Mexico, boundary lines between fields are marked by stone walls, which are hundreds of years old. And he goes on to describe excavation under these walls, where again, they found examples of the Yulesrud type figurines, including dinosaurs. And then an amazing, <laughs> just ingenious, uh, test was proposed uh, together with the chief of police of Acambaro. Uh, his house had been built some 50 years before Jules Rudd immigrated from Germany. It was one of the original houses. Adobe brick was the construction material. He said, let's dig under the house of the police chief, under the living room floor. And if these figurines are found there, then obviously Jules Rudd would not be the source of this material. And so they did that. Here we see the mayor uh, standing in attention. He also conducted a three-month investigation into the possibility that maybe someone had manufactured these, questioning people throughout the area uh, for any knowledge of uh, anyone manufacturing such figurines. When you fire them, uh, it would be known. Here we see a brick factory right at the base of El Toro, where many of them were found. When you fire the brick, you make smoke, and uh, especially when you're burning wood, which would be the source of the fire, the material to, to fire them. And uh, you can't do this without being known. And in a three-month investigation, the police chief found no evidence that they had been manufactured recently. In uh, the book, Host with a Big Hat, Earl Stanley Gardner pictures here uh, a diagram of the police chief's house, and there under the floor, uh, it's pointed out that 43 pieces of the Yules Rudd uh, figurines were found under the floor of the police chief <laughs> of the city of Acambaro. Uh, and so, he continues to describe the investigation, saying, we had our cameras with us and took pictures, particularly of the weathered adobe bricks with the various fragments cemented firmly in place. These adobe bricks originated 50 years before Yules Rudd arrived on the scene. And in the brick embedded in them, you can see the pieces of the figurines and the pieces of pottery from the Chapicaro culture. He continues saying, we scratched around enough on the cut bank of Bull Hill or El Toro to see that the soil was liberally studded with artifacts. 
And then he has pictures of these artifacts in the brick. Uh, obviously, Yulsra didn't do this. And then concludes, and this is a very flat-footed statement for a criminologist, a careful scientist to make. He says, it is absolutely, positively out of the question to think that these artifacts, which he saw, could have been planted. Now, that's Perry Mason, <laughs> or Earl Stanley Gardner's conclusion. He proved it. In, in, in his mind, there was no question but that these certainly go back much further than Earl Stanley Gardner. We didn't really know what dinosaurs looked like before the 1900s, or didn't know that well. We had a, a very poor view, and we'll talk more about that in a moment. Uh, but further testing was done by these two men, Hapgood and Gardner. Uh, radiocarbon dates uh, were obtained, submitted by Professor Hapgood to Isotopes Incorporated in New Jersey. And uh, sample number one was about 3,500 years, and then 6,400 years, and then uh, 3,000 years. And so there was a significant range. But if these are over 200 years, they are before we knew anything about dinosaurs, and they're supposed to have been gone then for 65 million years? Well, 6,000, 3,000, 2,000, probably just over 3,000 years ago, uh, we have figurines. They were also submitted by Professor Hapgood to the University of Pennsylvania Museum Testing Facility for thermoluminescent dating, which is probably the most appropriate dating system for pottery. Uh, we won't go into great detail about how that works, uh, but it's, it's a different type system and particularly suited for pottery. Sample number one came back about 2500 BC, uh, and then number two and number three and number four all right on the same date, 2500, very consistently. Uh, and this would logically be the most reasonable conclusion for the date. Obviously, these labs are going to come under scrutiny for putting out such material, and that was the case here. Nevertheless, uh, Dr. Rainey, who's director of the Pennsylvania Museum, issued a statement regarding this, uh, defending his conclusion. He said, we've had years of experimentation both here and at the lab at Oxford, we have no doubt at all about the dependability of the thermoluminescent method. I should also point out, he continues, that we were so concerned about the extraordinarily ancient date of these figurines that Mark Hahn and our lab made an average of 18 runs on each one of the four samples. Four samples, 18 runs on each one, because this, this is extraordinary information, and uh, <laughs> they still continue to get the same consistent dates. Uh, he continues then saying, all in all, the lab stands on these dates for the Jules Rudd, mater Jules Rudd material, whatever this means in terms of archaeological dating in Mexico or in terms of the fake versus authentic pieces. The lab takes the stand because they were extraordinarily cautious mm -hmm and made 18 runs on four samples. Well, they took even greater flack when this letter came out, and three months later he withdrew it without giving any reason at all. Uh, I think I know exactly why he withdrew it, but he certainly was not because of empirical evidence. It was because of the philosophical pressure of his peers. With such information, I was intrigued. What, uh, what is the, the truth? What is the, the, the answer to this mystery in Acombro? I went down with uh, Dr. Dennis Swift to personally investigate this material. Uh, we were there in uh, 1999 twice, uh, and then in 2000, and actually we've, <laughs> we've made about a dozen trips now. When we first got there, this is the scene that depicts where they were, and actually they were locked in, in this door that you see in the background, behind that door with a padlock in the back of the police department. Uh, they were hoping nobody would find out about it. They were hidden and had been there for about 30 years. Um, why? Well, this is an embarrassment. You're not supposed to find evidence of humans and dinosaurs, and they wanted to appear uh, intelligent. And it took a great deal of effort to get that door open. But we finally did, and uh, with uh, 
pressure, actually, from outside sources, uh, political pressure, we were able to examine two of the 60 crates of materials that were stored behind that door the first time that we came down. And sure enough, even in just the two crates, which is a random sampling of over 60, uh, we found strange ceramic figurines, including figurines of dinosaurs. The second time we came down, we were able to e examine more crates, still not all of them. But here we have a number of them spread out on the table. Dr. Swift is actually mocking the, the great security <laughs> which these were guarded. They had a soldier there with an AK-47 guarding us. And as we looked at these figurines, he grabbed it from him and posed with the figurines. But uh, they had been, of course, under lock and key. Nobody could see them. But uh, with our investigation, we finally brought them to light and were able to make uh, a photographic uh, record of a number of these. We see in this picture uh, an, an amazing variety, uh, both of ethnicity and styles and materials that are reflected in these figurines. Of the 33,000, about 2,600 of them are of dinosaurs. And I think you can see that very obviously here. Uh, one amazing thing uh, about the sauropod types is that many of them were shown standing upright. We didn't know about this until Robert Bacher told us this in Dinosaur Heresies, in his book 1986. But it looks like he had one of the Acombero figurines shown here on the right as a model for what he illustrated in his book, Dinosaur Heresies. Of course, then Spielberg convinced us all that they, they stood upright. But 3,000 years ago, uh, obviously, they knew that down in Acombero. Now, this is what uh, we thought dinosaurs looked like way back in about 1850. This is supposed to be a picture of an iguanodon, one of the earliest dinosaurs that were excavated. Well, that's not very close, but that's what we thought in 1850. By the turn of the century, this was 1895, we had him depicted differently, kind of a stand-up alligator with a long tail dragging the floor. Not very accurate, but closer. But now then we know that Iguanodon looked like this. This is a restoration from uh, the year 2000. So now we've got a pretty good idea. Notice the almost horse-like head and the, the tail that sticks out right. The ossified tendons along the tail show that it was uh, stood out right like a bird. Uh, if it drooped to the ground, that meant it was broken. But notice how the people in a Combero uh, depicted this over 3,000 years ago just almost identical to what we now have finally learned. This is the way they looked <laughs> when we first started in the 1800s, 1900s, but now then we know it looks like this, and the folks in the Combro got it right 3,000 years ago, as they did with the, the stand-up sauropods. Another figurine appears uh, to look just like the ankylosaur that we see depicted here. <laughs> very, very similar. Uh, there's a wide range. I suppose sauropods are the most popular, but 2,600 of these that I've examined, I have 20,000 digital image, images that I personally took of this collection. We've examined it carefully. Here are flying pterosaurs and uh, a totally different style, different materials, uh, obviously a different artist. Um, some of the critics have said, well, it's all made by the same fella uh, in a short period of time, uh, to, to, and the, the numbers were to impress people. 33,000 is, is kind of overkill, isn't it? And certainly there's a tremendous variety of styles and materials not made out of the same stuff as is obvious to an objective observer. Uh, but a bewildering array of mysterious creatures. What in the world were these for? Uh, I think the most reasonable explanation is that they were apropopatic. This is a, a fancy word that archaeologists use, uh, actually coined from the investigations over in Mesopotamia, where they found caches of these buried under the threshold of dwellings, or where dwellings had been. 
and we find these often in caches of 20 uh, up to 30 in uh, packed in sand surrounded of course by the clay soil and it would appear that they were buried carefully some have suggested maybe the enemies were coming and they buried their gods their idols uh, to protect them from the invasion I strongly suspect they were like the apropatic uh, figurines in Mesopotamia that were buried under the threshold to ward off evil spirits and that's what this fancy word means it's to, to scare off the evil spirits well if you're going to scare off spirits I suppose dinosaur figurines would be as efficient as any uh, but the bottom line we don't know these are several different ideas that have been proposed it's interesting to lo notice again that 20, in 2600 you've got a tremendous variety and the association with people seems to be uh, closer and more, uh, uh, more frequent with the juvenile forms. I think I can understand that I mean, if you watch Jurassic Park, but some of the juvenile forms are depicted uh, you know, they're kind of cute and uh, uh, we can see why uh, humans might be more closely associated with with these forms. We also find, besides dinosaurs, other uh, uh, out of place figurines. Here is a horse. This is typical of the Pleistocene horse, Ice Age, uh, which wasn't supposed to be in Mexico till the Spaniards brought the horses. Uh, here is another one that uh, is with a man trying to ride it uh, who has lost his head. It's broken in this figurine. But uh, an amazing turn of events involves the, the find of the unfossilized tooth of a Pleistocene horse associated with the Pleistocene horse itself. This tooth was identified by George Gaylord Simpson of Harvard, who is uh, the leading expert on fossil horses, uh, was the leading expert in the world. Well, here is the Pleistocene horse. Here is the Pleistocene tooth unfossilized found with it. Uh, the mystery deepens, or at least maybe <laughs> the, the picture contrary to the standard evolutionary picture is, uh, is getting more difficult. Uh, we went back to try to verify Gardner's research. I think he did an excellent job. We thought, well, let's just look and see if we can repeat what he did and uh, re-verify. Uh, we wanted to do original excavations and we approached this with uh, some of the leading experts to get permits and permits have to be obtained from ENA this is the Institute of uh, Archaeology there in Mexico and we applied three different times with the University of Texas first and then with uh, David Soleil who at the time was director of the Museum of the Rockies He's actually Jack Horner's boss. Jack Horner is the individual, if you saw Jurassic Park, the real life character that uh, it, it, the story is based on. He's the, the fellow I represented just digging up dinosaurs up in Montana. Well, his boss, the director of Museum of the Rockies, David Soleil, went with us and we applied together for permits and they were all denied. And we were told firmly, actually the mayor of Acombero was told that we would never be given a permit that uh, the implications would not be allowed. Actually, we found out that ENA had done their own investigation back in 1953. They sent four archaeologists to Acombro to do official excavations there. They chose their own site over a mile away from Yulesrud site, and they found figurines, a number of them, six feet down, including dinosaurs, and acknowledged that the figurines were authentic, but not so with the dinosaurs, which were found in the same place by them at the same time, at the same level, together. They couldn't be, and uh, we actually intercepted the interdepartmental memo, and we have exactly what they said about this, and this is from a memo dated February 24th, 1954. Apparently, those artifacts were gathered scientifically, but even so, they are reproductions of relatively recent times, and they're talking here about the dinosaurs. Uh, in our opinion, it is impossible that man existed at the same time as those saurian that lived millions of years ago. So they're acknowledging, yes, they are dinosaur figurines, but they could not have been with man, and so they just simply deny it. 
Continuing, they say, it's our opinion, in our opinion, the only archaeological artifacts are the collections of vessels and other Chipiquero pieces that they found at the same time. These are authentic and represent great archaeological value for our study. So in the same hole, at the same time, <laughs> they found authentic ones, but dinosaurs with them couldn't be, and so they just deny it. That's why it is the philosophical pressure that says you cannot have humans and dinosaurs together. That would destroy the picture of evolution that's in the textbooks. And so here's what's real and here's what's not, not based on the evidence, but based on the philosophical conclusions. We brought an expert down to examine these. This is uh, Jim Collins, who is with the University of Texas. He's an art instructor, a ceramics expert. And he found a, a number of things about these uh, figurines that we didn't know. For instance, uh, he found many, or most of them, were actually double fired. Some had wondered how such fragile figurines could be uh, maintained intact in the earth all of these years. And of course, if you go to the Museum of Anthropology in Mexico City, you'll see dozens uh, of similar figurines that remained intact, which they don't question. But these have been double fired. These people uh, were rather sophisticated in their technique. And of course, somebody just making fakes by the thousands wouldn't go to this kind of trouble. Uh, you can see that some of them were broken, and where they are, you can see evidence of this slip on the outside that is uh, a sophisticated pottery technique. This is compared with the broken piece from the National Museum of Anthropology and compares favorably with it, actually better fired than this uh, excellent piece. We went back to the house that the police chief owned, uh, under which Earl Stanley Gardner had uh, excavated 43 pieces of Yule's Rudd type material and found that it had been covered with modern brick now in modern times and that was somewhat disappointed. We wanted to see the adobe brick. We did look across the street and sure enough there it had not been covered by modern brick. The adobe brick was still obvious and as we looked carefully here uh, Professor Collins is looking closely at those brick and you can see Yes, as Earl Stanley Gardner said, they are studied with the pottery pieces from the Chipiquero culture, and that's obvious. And as we look carefully at one of the bricks, this is directly across the street from the house of the police chief, where Earl Stanley Gardner investigated. In one of those bricks, lo and behold, there's a dinosaur sticking his face out. And if you listen very carefully, you can hear him say, na 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 <laughs> just making a mockery of the idea that man and humans have to be millions of years apart. Uh, these brick done 50 years before Yules Rudd arrived contained pieces of the uh, ancient Chipiquero culture which were scattered in the clay and scooped up and uh, used to, to make brick, not intentionally taking the fragments, but you just can't scoop up the material without getting some of them in it. Let's go back and look carefully at some of the witnesses who have testified to the fact that they helped Yules Rudd excavate these and that these were parts of uh, what was found from original excavations. One of the more credible witnesses, I believe, would be the grandson of Walter Mary Yules Rudd. He is uh, a rather well-known contractor. Uh, in the area. Uh, he is uh, well-to-do, well-educated. He's standing here beside the grave of his grandfather, testifying about going out and excavating these figurines with him. We have uh, uh, about 20 minutes of recorded testimonies with him standing right there by the grave, telling of the figurines that he helped his father excavate. Uh, this is one of the ones that he had in his uh, very nice home there uh, in Lyon. And here, uh, this, this is a beautiful dinosaur of the sauropod type that he personally excavated with his grandfather. We also found, as we investigated uh, and talked to a number of witnesses, that El Toro was not the only site where dinosaurs were found. On the opposite side of the city, the north side, you find El Chivo. Goat Mountain, and at the base of this mountain there was a lake and a site where 
ancient Chipicoro people had, uh, had made dwellings, and uh, you can see places where the, the dwellings were there uh, between the lake site and the bottom of the hill. And I was taken there by uh, an individual, uh, Mr. Espinoza, who is now an accountant there in Acombro, who as a teenager went with uh, Waldemar Yulsrud. He had enlisted several of the young people to go with him to help him dig and to help him carry back the materials that they found. And he took me to the spot. He said, here is where we dig, where we dug, and here is the type of thing we found. He drew sketches of the materials. A very credible witness. And then we have Dr. Hineon, who is uh, actually a hero in Acombro, or at least uh, I, I would describe him as such. Several did to me. Uh, he has a medical practice in, uh, in Guadalajara, uh, several miles away, but he comes back on the weekends to help the poor people of Acombro. Uh, their culture, their, their, their economy is not nearly so thriving, and many of them are poor. And he practices medicine there in Acombro, free of charge, to help those who are poor. He could run for mayor and win hands down. He's not interested in that. He's interested in helping people. But he told us that he was one of the ones who went with Yulsrud to excavate these. He excavated them uh, with him underground that was hard packed, covered with grass and with cactus. And uh, on one occasion, they got literally two big sacks, these uh, uh, what we would call toe sacks, uh, burlap sacks, uh, full of these figurines in one trip, put them on the back of a burrow and came back. A uh, very credible witness uh, who is certainly willing to affirm that this is the case even today. And then we have uh, Mr. Martinez, who was formerly chief of the federal police in the area just uh, about 10 years earlier when this picture was taken. He is now retired. Uh, and he is uh, an interesting, uh, he tells an interesting story because he actually confiscated over 3,000 of these figurines from two individuals who were illegally excavating at El Chivo. They had found where a number of these were buried and they were just digging up a storm in the middle of the night and selling them across the border. And he caught them and put them in the federal penitentiary. They were convicted of dealing in illegal artifacts. And so the federal government decided these were real, authentic antiquities and put them in jail. He said among these artifacts that they had excavated were, in, were dinosaurs, and he drew sketches of several of them. Uh, they were then added to the Yulsrud collection, which is there in Acombro still today. Uh, but some people will say, well, Yulsrud was the source of all of these. Well, we, we can prove they were there before Yulsrud. We can prove they were excavated after Yulsrud. And the federal government actually helped us verify that by convicting these people who had excavated them there at El Chivo uh, and uh, are now doing time for that crime. Then we have uh, Mr. Perel, very interesting individual. He was uh, former director of archaeology of the Camaro Zone of the National Museum of Anthropology in Mexico City, the largest anthropological museum in the world. At the time Yulsrud was in Acombro, he was uh, the director of archaeology for the area, and it was his job to verify and to authenticate the finds, and he and Yulsrud were actually antagonists. They didn't get along well at all because Yulsrud didn't go to the trouble of getting permits most of the time, and uh, he would uh, complain and uh, threaten to put him in jail, and uh, they fussed and fought all the time, but he saw the figurines that Yulsrud excavated. Furthermore, the farmers at the time continually found such figurines, and he was called in to authenticate and verify. He said he saw hundreds of them excavated by farmers that Yulsrud had nothing to do with. Many of them took them to Yulsrud, uh, who would often pay the farmers just a small fee to help increase his collection. He worked with Ramon Pinochon, who is perhaps the most famous archaeologist in Mexico history. He was 20 years uh, president of the National Museum of Anthropology, uh, again, the largest anthropological museum in the world. And they particularly worked together on a dig at Chipicuro 
uh, in the 1940s uh, where they were getting ready to flood the area, putting up a dam, and had to move some of the tombs, the graves of the ancient Chipiquero sites. And here we see a picture of uh, that dig with uh, an early picture of Ramon Pinachon and Beatrice, his wife, whom he met on that trip and married. She became an archeologist and uh, is still an archeologist serving in one of the museums there in Mexico City today. We found the uh, permit from Ina, which uh, authorized this dig. We found the notes. This is actually in the museum in Chapicro of the dig, and they have displayed a couple of the pictures. Uh, I took this picture of some of the artifacts that came from that dig, uh, supervised by Ramon Pinachon. Mr. Perea, who was there, representing the museum at the time, he was the director of that area, worked with them. He says, in this tomb, this but the ones in this picture, they found a dinosaur. That is not a figurine, but an actual dinosaur that was about 30 feet long. He said it had the short little front feet and the huge long legs, about three foot head with the huge teeth. We have his recorded testimony, about two hours of a detailed description of exactly what they found. He said Ramon Pinachon took pictures of this he has the pictures. Well, that pricked our ears up. Uh, Ramon Pinachon had been dead about two years at that time, but his wife, we suspected, would have the pictures. We went to her. She said, yes, I had them. I've seen the pictures. Uh, I have donated them to Ina, the Institute of Archaeology. Uh, well, that was disappointing because they had stonewalled our effort to get permits. But she called them at our request asked them to allow uh, us to examine these photographs. We got in the cab, we went immediately to the Institute of Archaeology, walked in the door. The supervisor there who met us recognized me in my previous attempts to get permits, and he said, no, you cannot see them. He had promised Beatri Beatrix Pinachon that uh, we would be allowed, but he says, I don't care what I promised, you can't see them. This was a stone wall. Uh, we've run into this several times. That information is there. It's being covered up. Uh, interestingly, in association with that, we found this picture of Waldemar Yulsrud, which is in the museum there today, uh, the Yulsrud Museum, which we'll look at in a moment. Um, and here he's standing with a large dinosaur bone. In his book, Enigmas of the Past, uh, he describes finding uh, partially buried a dinosaur with uh, fresh bones that is unfossilized and here he's standing there with one of those bones and we took the picture to some experts to see if they, they could identify that uh, and here we see Brooks Britt uh, of the Department of Geology at Brigham Young University uh, making the comment the large bone appears to be a sauropod rib that's and so we find the tooth from the horse, uh, we find the sauropod rib, we find the testimony of a buried dinosaur from uh, Mr. Pena, who, who was director uh, of the uh, Institute of Archaeology there for the Acombro Zone, um, or at least the Museum of Archaeology for the Acombro Zone, all testifying that there were dinosaurs not too long ago, uh, unfossilized remains. As we look at the incredible variety of styles and materials and subjects of the 33,000 figurines, it's just mind-boggling. I think we're looking at a pig here, maybe. Uh, probably a pig here, but this wasn't made by the same fellow. This is a totally different style. And maybe that's a pig, but certainly very, very different. Possibly we're looking at a dog here. Uh, another one here with his master that looks a lot like Chewbacca. <laughs> uh, here's, uh, I guess, a bird rather stylistically done and another totally different bird. But the array of styles is just uh, mind-boggling. Uh, Dr. Uh, or Professor Collins estimated there were at least a hundred different artists that were involved in producing this vast array. It's interesting to no notice the, the uh, variety of ethnicity that's represented. This appears to be an Egyptian uh, motif, 
uh, from some of the figurines, again from the collection, and many of them are very oriental in style, as you can see here, and some of them are very African in style. Uh, it seems undeniable that these have an African appearance, while others are, are very European. Again, from 3,000 years ago. Notice the very uh, artistically done dinosaur here compared with a totally different style, not done by the same artist. And I don't know who did that, maybe somebody with a, a nightmare that got scared to death by them. But certainly different styles. Here's a rather stylistic, uh, artistically done dinosaur, very different. Some of them almost cartoonish. Uh, Again, totally different styles, different materials, uh, obviously different artists, but a vast array. Uh, and as we look at the general configuration, is there any doubt what's being depicted here? Uh, they had to have been seeing the dinosaurs uh, some 3,000 years ago. And here's just example after example. This Diplodocus type looks like it stepped out of a Spielberg movie. Uh, again, if you know dinosaurs, you recognize immediately some of these forms. And though some of them are uh, cartoonish and stylistically done, uh, there's no question as to what we're looking at. Here's the Stegosaurus. This is another one, but a different artist did this one in a totally different style. Again, one after another, you see <laughs> unquestionable resemblance. Many of them uh, were in the form of pendants uh, with a hole in the center they wore around their neck, again, lending credibility to the idea these were to scare off the evil spirits. Uh, but we saw literally dozens of these, and many of the figures of the people could be seen with these pendants uh, sculpted in, in the figurine. Man with dinosaur. How do you <laughs> avoid the conclusion? Many of them are seen fighting. Sometimes the man's getting the best of the fight and sometimes the dinosaur, and usually with smaller ones, uh, we would assume more juvenile forms. Here the, the dinosaur is getting the best of him. Uh, many times with the, the juvenile forms, as you can see, some of them still uh, showing uh, some ferocity even as juveniles. But uh, the depiction of them fighting together here, the dinosaur getting the best, and here the man getting the best shows the kind of conflict that very likely was going on at this time. Here's one with a spear in his neck, but uh, very closely resembling uh, our modern knowledge of what dinosaurs look like. Uh, this one is my wife's favorite. <laughs> um, we could go on and on and on, 2,600 of them. On a recent trip to Mexico, we made additional discoveries here at the foot of El Toro. Actually, we didn't do the digging, but this was done by an individual who was digging clay for bricks. He has his own brick factory and permits to uh, take clay from this area, right at the foot of El Toro, not far from where Jules Rudd had done his excavations. And he showed us a number of the beautiful vases and figures that he had gotten from the area. And uh, one of them was extremely interesting. Uh, this dinosauran type creature is very similar to the Bullosaurus, depicted here by Romer. Uh, a, a very obvious similarity, but again, the dermal frills along the back are typical of the, uh, the dinosaur type. And uh, a number like this were found, and this was done, of course, <laughs> Uh, in, in the, about the year 2000, 2002, 2003, uh, continuing the excavation, he continues to find these long, long after Yulshrad, of course, has passed away. They continue to be excavated in spite of uh, Ina's strong effort to keep us from doing that. We can't or uh, we would be in jail because we don't have the permits. But he did have a permit to get them for his brick factory, or at least to get the clay. Now then, these uh, figurines are housed in the Waldemar Yulsrud Museum there in Acombro. When we arrived on the scene, they were locked in the back of the police department. <laughs> uh, as we began to tell them the significance and began to present the evidence and show how they had been verified, uh, 
from, from various sources, they decided this was significant information, and in spite of Ina's opposition, they put up a museum, and they're very prominently and, and uh, very professionally displayed, and you can go to a Combro and see these and hear the story of Waldemar Yulzrud and see some of the pictures that we've shown you. Uh, we see the director of the museum today on the left, uh, together with the wife of an archaeologist who has helped us there, Dr. Swift and myself in front of the museum in a picture taking res taken recently. Now, let's summarize the evidence. There is the radiometric dating, which helps us understand, especially with a variety of examples for a few thousand years. Uh, radiocarbon first, uh, according to Hapgood, some three to 6,000 years, and then thermoluminescent dating that was consistently at about 4,000 years, or 2,500 B.C., and then also uh, a recent radiocarbon dating was done by Neil Steedy, which indicated 1.5 to 4,000, uh, a range. Uh, but still, if you have it more than 200 years, <laughs> again, you have uh, the, the destruction of the story that's told in the textbooks. Looking at the witnesses and summarizing, there's Waldemar Yulsrud, who was co-discoverer of the Chipiquaro culture, collected over 37,000 artifacts, wrote the book, Enigmas del Pasado, or uh, Mysteries of the Past. Carlos Yulsrud, his son, who also described excavating dinosaurs with his father. And then the grandson, Carlos Yulsrud, who described excavating dinosaurs with his grandfather and recorded that testimony beside his grandfather's tomb and showed us examples that he'd excavated. There is Dr. Hinion, physician Guadalajara, that described his excavations with Yulsrud as a youth and sketched some of the dinosaurs that he found. There is Mr. Espinoza, who is an accountant, uh, who personally took us to the site where he had excavated and also sketched dinosaurs that he had found. There is per, uh, Carlos Perea, who was former director of archaeology of the Acomoro Zone of the National Museum of Anthropology, who described excavations with Ramon Pinachon, uh, dinosaurs and humans together. And then there's Charles Hapgood, professor of history of anthropology, University of New Hampshire. He excavated dinosaur figurines under roads, uh, helped excavate under the house of the police chief and uh, under walls, stone walls that had been there for hundreds of years, and wrote the book, Mystery of Acombro, detailing his investigation. Uh, together with Earl Stanley Gardner, the famous author of Perry Mason, a criminologist, a district attorney uh, in the Los Angeles area for 30 years, uh, proved, I think beyond any shadow of a doubt, he certainly claimed so, uh, that the figurines predated Yules Rudd beyond any shadow of a doubt. And then there's the mayor of Acombro, uh, who worked together with Earl Stanley Gardner and conducted his own three-month investigation for fraud, trying to find anyone who had not know, knew anything about manufacturing these things and allowed the excavation under his floor. There's Mr. Marinas, number 10, <laughs> who was the chief of federal police. Uh, Guadalajara confiscated uh, over 3,000 of these figurines from two who were excavating illegally. Uh, including dinosaurs in the collection and sketched those for us. Now that's a huge collection of witnesses. If you were in court trying to refute the testimony of such individuals, you'd be in serious trouble. There's Waldemar Yulsrud, there is Carlos the son, there is again Carlos the grandson, there's Dr. Hinion, there is the accountant Mr. Espinoza, there's Carlos Perea, the director of the Acombro Zone for the National Museum, there's Charles Hapgood of the University of New Hampshire, there's Earl Stanley Gardner, author of Perry Mason, the mayor of the city, and then the chief of the federal police. That's an impressive array of witnesses and they all testify to the authenticity of these figurines that Yulsrud certainly was not the author, they were there long before he was. I think the conclusion is absolutely inescapable that humans and dinosaurs live together. The only opposition, the only problem, the only reason that's not just really obvious and accepted without question is the philosophical implication. NOVA did an investigation of some of this material, produced the brief uh, video, God, Darwin, and the Dinosaurs, in which they discussed the subject, dinosaurs side by side with humans, particularly with reference to the evidence at Glen Rose, Texas. 
But they showed clearly the implications, saying finding them would counter evidence that humans evolved long after dinosaurs became extinct. Now that's the fundamental conclusion that they will deny and will not accept. And back up the claim that all species, including man, were created at one time. Now that's the significance, according to Nova, and I think they're absolutely correct. That's why many refuse to accept the obvious implications. I think we ought to be honest and just follow the evidence where it leads. That's good science, that's good archeology, span and uh, that's what we ought to believe.